Well, let's open our Bibles to Daniel chapter 4. Boy, I like the new seating arrangement. It's kind of nice. You can have some coffee. I think Pastor Dave said we could have coffee in here tonight. Too bad you didn't know that before you came in, huh? Okay. <laughs> You can get up and go get a cup if you want. Tonight's a very special night. It's okay. You can come and go as you please. No worries. It is Thanksgiving, okay? Um, no food, though. That'll be tomorrow at 1. Tomorrow at 1. Daniel chapter 4. As we come to Daniel chapter 4, we come to the second uh, dream of King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, you recall the first dream was back in chapter 2. And it troubled him because he, he saw a dream of this image, this large image uh, made up of various metals as well as clay. And we saw that only Daniel uh, could not only tell the king what the dream was about, uh, I mean, uh, tell him what the dream was, but also gave him the interpretation of the dream. And the point of the first dream in Daniel chapter 2 is pretty simple. Nebuchadnezzar, your kingdom will fall. Your kingdom will come to an end. The Babylonian Empire will fall, and it will be succeeded by the Medo-Persian Empire, and then the Grecian Empire, then the Roman Empire, and subsequently, looking forward to the seven years of tribulation, to the revived Roman Empire. But because of Nebuchadnezzar's pride, he would have none of that. So in chapter 3, he builds his own image of gold, 90 feet tall, 9 feet wide, which uh, points to and speaks of himself and the Babylonian Empire. And in effect, Nebuchadnezzar was saying, God, psh, you're wrong. I will not fall, and my kingdom will not come to an end. So he built this giant statue because of his pride. Now, as we come to chapter 4, God gives him a second dream, which reiterates or drives home the point of the first dream. Yes, Nebuchadnezzar, you will fall. Because the second dream is a dream of a giant tree that gets cut down, which of course represents Nebuchadnezzar and subsequently the uh, Babylonian Empire. A and the point is pretty powerful. Nebuchadnezzar, because of his pride, thought he would never be cut down. But because of his pride, he would in fact be cut down like this giant tree. Now, this Second dream here in Daniel chapter 4, most scholars believe happened in the 35th year of Nebuchadnezzar's 43-year reign as king of Babylon, which would put it about 570 B.C. And as we put the numbers together, as we look at chapter 4 in light of uh, the seven years in which he went crazy, more on that in a few moments, uh, he was subsequently restored and he would sit on the throne of Babylon and finish out the 43 years of his reign. Now, that means that chapter 4 is about 30 years after chapter 3. And I hope you're getting all of this. There will be a test after class. Now, if you're taking notes here in chapter 4 in these 34 verses, uh, 37 verses, excuse me, we're going to look at six things. There are six things we would outline here regarding the king in this second dream. Number one, the first thing involves the declaration of the king. Number one, the declaration of the king. That's in verses 1 through 3. Take a look. In Daniel chapter 4, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, He's making this declaration to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are His signs and how mighty are His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and His dominion is from generation to generation. So the first thing involves the declaration of the king. And, and this becomes kind of interesting because here in verses 1 through 3, Nebuchadnezzar had all the right words. However, he had all the wrong actions. 
Nebuchadnezzar said, God is wonderful. His works are wondrous, that God is mighty, and that his kingdom will never fall. Yes, he had all the right words. Yes, he was saying all the right things. But when we get down into verse 8 and verse 30, we're going to see that ultimately he did not believe in God and he wasn't living his life for God. And unfortunately, that scenario is what we often see in people's lives today. Oh, they say the right things. They have the right words. They know the Christianese language forward and backward. But man, they're not living their life for Jesus Christ. You know, we can say the right things, but the question is, are we doing the right things? We can talk a good talk, but are we walking a good walk? You know, uh, in Matthew's gospel, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, Jesus said, many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done wonders in your name? And Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. Look, it's not just what we say. It's what we do. It's the life we live. And unfortunately, this declaration, even though it was right on the money, it didn't ring true because it didn't manifest itself in his life. Well, let's come to the second thing we want to look at. And we've looked at the declaration of the king. Now, number two, let's take a look at the request by the king. In verses four through seven, we have the request by the king. Take a look. In verse four of Daniel four, it says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. So the request by the king is kind of interesting because with this second dream, Nebuchadnezzar does what he did with the first dream. He calls in all his wise men, all his magicians, all his soothsayers, all the Chaldeans, all the astrologers to get them to interpret the dream, which I find very odd because if they couldn't interpret the dream the first time, what makes them think they can interpret the dream a second time? So I guess the problem is pretty self-evident. The problem is that Nebuchadnezzar was turning to the world for help rather than turning to God for help. He just declared how good God was and how wonderful all of his kingdoms are, and yet he still turned to the world. And boy, what a, a life lesson that should be for us. You know, the world has some wisdom. Don't misunderstand. But ultimately, in dealing with spiritual issues, like he's dealing with here, it's worthless to turn to the world for help. You know, 1 Corinthians 3.19 says that the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. And when we turn to the world for help rather than to the Lord, well, we're turning to the wrong source. But I found it interesting, and, and note carefully in verse 4, it, it says he was resting in his house and flourishing in his palace. And yet, according to verse 5, he was still afraid and troubled. So he not only was turning to the world, he was trusting in the world. <laughs> Another big mistake. The first mistake is turning to the world for help. The second mistake is trusting in the world for that help. And this is something all of us need to be careful in our own hearts, in our own lives. Because it's very easy for us to rely upon our own resources, our own strength, our own power, our own pocketbook, 
to try to rectify the circumstances and situations in our lives. And we think, well, you know, I've got enough money, I can take care of this. Or I've got enough wisdom, I can deal with that. Well, I've got enough strength, I can handle that. And we end up trusting in everything and everyone other than the Lord. You know, Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, 17, do not trust in the uncertainty of riches, but trust in the living God. And I guess the question for us is where are we putting our trust? First of all, where are we turning to, to help, for help? And second, who are we putting our trust in? Because in dealing with life and the circumstances that come in life, you know, God's given us a brain and we should use it. Uh, there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. I, I'm not trying to, to, trying to boo-hoo any of these other things. Don't misunderstand. But ultimately, you know, we need to put our trust in the Lord. We need to turn to the Lord for our help, for our, our resources, to enable us to get through these circumstances and situations in life. Because here is Nebuchadnezzar. He had it all. Man, he's resting in his, in his house. He's flourishing in his palaces. And he's still fearful. He's still afraid. And that tells you and that tells me that no matter where we're at in life, how cushy life may be for us, if we're not putting our faith in Jesus Christ, there can still be great fear. You know as well as I do, there's a lot of people today with all the riches of the world and they're still petrified. They're still terrified of what's going on in the world or what's happening in their lives because there's no rest. There's no peace. Why? Because there's no Jesus. Look, if the world would just turn to the Lord, everything would be peachy keen. Everything would be honky-dory. Man, everything would be cruising right along if they would just turn to Jesus rather than trying to implement all of the, the, the silliness of the world, which is really foolishness to God, 1 Corinthians 3.19. Well, back to Daniel chapter 4. Let's come to the third thing we want to look at. The third thing involves the dream of the king. Number three, the dream of the king. Uh, that's in verses 8 through 18. In verse 8 of Daniel 4, it says, But at last Daniel came before me. Daniel means God is my judge. His name in the Babylonian Aramaic language is Belteshazzar, Lady, protect the king, according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you and no secret troubles you, explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it can be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beast of the fields found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was, fe uh, was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head, well, on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Chop! down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and the roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man. Let him be given the heart of an animal. And let seven times, probably seven years, pass over him. This decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he will, and sets over it the lowest of men. 
This dream I, Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, or Daniel, declare its interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation. But you are able, for the spirit of the holy God is in you. So here, a very interesting dream about this great tree. It provides food and shelter for all, but one day it is cut down. Uh, the only thing that remains is the stump and the roots, and a bronze and iron uh, uh, band is placed around it, if you will. And then it changes from the tree to him in verse 15, which no doubt points to and speaks of Nebuchadnezzar where God will take out his heart and give him a heart of an animal for seven times, according to verse 16. Most scholars believe it speaks of a seven-year period of time where Nebuchadnezzar will go crazy, and we'll talk more on that in just a moment. But the point here of this dream is very simply seen in verse 17. The point of the dream is pretty simple. It's so that all, verse 17, so that all will know that God is sovereign and that God rules over the kingdom of men. And I got to tell you, this should bless each and every one of us to no end. You know, back in Daniel 2.21, we saw that God raises up kings and God takes down kings. In other words, God is sovereign over the affairs of man and the kingdoms of men. Uh, turn over two pages to chapter 5, if you would, for a moment. Daniel chapter 5, drop down to verse 21. Uh, it, it makes it very clear that the he, back in verse 16, refers to Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse 21 of Daniel chapter 5. It says, Then he, Nebuchadnezzar, was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beast, just as God prophesied it, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. Wow. Question. Does God put in place all of the leaders in every kingdom, in every era around the whole world? The answer is yes. You say, well, Clark, he really messed up, didn't he? <laughs> well, you know, uh, I mean, look, you got Putin, you got all these other guys, and you're thinking, wow, Lord, what are you doing? I mean, how could you appoint them? They're pretty messed up. Well, the truth of the matter is, whether we know it, like it, agree with it or not, God knows what he's doing. Okay, that was very weak. <laughs> Look, whether we like it or not, God's on the throne, he's sovereign, and he's ruling over the affairs of men. And as we see the world today, wow, we think of all the immorality. I mean, you know, the more immoral and the more sin uh, you have in your life, it, the more it's celebrated in the world. I mean, anything anti-God is just endorsed, encouraged, and celebrated. No matter how deviant it may be, God help us. But does that mean God's not orchestrating and according to his plan? You know, Paul said in these last days, evil men and imposters are going to grow worse and worse. You know things aren't going to get better, right? You know that, right? Ooh, that's a real reason to give thanks, isn't it? <laughs> Should be a good Thanksgiving message for tomorrow. <laughs> We're all going to die. No, um, just kidding, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Now, I'm not saying we should throw up our hands, throw, throw in the towel, and call it quits. Don't misunderstand. We need to stand up, let our voice be heard. We need to put people in office that hold biblical values. I, I know nobody's perfect, believe you me. Uh, but, but, you know, we know at least which direction to head toward because we've got the Word of God to guide us and direct us. But even though when things don't work out the way we hope they do or way, the way we think they should... The fact of the matter is God is in absolute, total control of everything and everyone all the time. 
We look what's happening in the Middle East. We look what's happening in America. We look what's happening all around the world, and we think, wow, man, we are circling the drain. And, and truly, we might be. This might be bringing us to the brink of the end. I don't know. I'm not sure. Or it could be, like it has been in the past, just a wake-up call, just a, a nudge, a reminder of how important it is we get right with God. I'm not sure. I don't know. But I know this. In Proverbs 21.1, the Bible says that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. And like the rivers of water, he turns it as he wills. It's all according to God's will, whether we know it, like it, agree with it or not. And I got to tell you, when we understand that truth, precious family, when we truly grab a hold of that, there's going to be some rest and peace in our hearts. We watch the news, we read about the news, and we think, whoa, the world's on fire. Well, okay. It just means that God's Word's true. It just means that the Word of God is being fulfilled right before our eyes, we might say. And it proves that God is in total control. And what is true for the world in general, listen gang, is equally true for our lives individually. Look, we're, ch we're children of God. I've given my heart and my life to God, so I want Him to do in my life whatever He wants to do, however He wants to do it. I'm not always sure what that means, and sometimes it's not very comfortable. In fact, sometimes it's very painful. Does anybody understand what we're talking about? And we say, God, I belong to you. So you do with me as you see fit. Well, let's come to a fourth thing we want to look at. We said there were six. And that's the interpretation for the king. The interpretation for the king. Uh, that is in verses 19 through 27. Back to Daniel chapter 4. Pick it up in verse 19. In Daniel 4.19, it says, Then Daniel, whose name was Belshazzar, was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. <laughs> so, he, so the king spoke and said, Belshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concerning your enemies. Now, Daniel knew the interpretation of the dream, but it troubled him to tell the king what the interpretation was. So he's, his desire or his wishes is that the interpretation of the dream, which of course is the destruction of this tree and subsequently the destruction, destruction of Babylon, would come upon his enemies, not him. You know, I thought that was kind of interesting. Because if I were Daniel, I might have walked up to the king and said, well, you know what, Dan, you know what, Neb? You're going to get what you deserve. And let me tell you what this dream is all about. The tree is you, and God's going to cut you down because of the pride in your, I mean, you know, I'm, I might have been a little more direct with him. You, you can pray for me. <laughs> but he didn't do that. Man, he, he showed a lot of compassion to Nebuchadnezzar. And, and quite possibly, he was even offering forgiveness to Nebuchadnezzar for the pride he exhibited in his life. And if that's the case, and I think it, it, it might be, it really sets a pretty good example for us because when we deal with somebody who deserves what they're going to get, that blesses me. I want to see God just rain down fire from heaven and just consume them. Amen? Okay, again, you can pray for me. I mean, look, I don't overtly say that, but you know, sometimes in my heart, and, and you, know, you know what I'm talking about when you're on the 91 and someone cuts you off and you're thinking, oh, Lord, just bless them. But in your heart, you're saying, God, just send a boulder down from this sky and roll it right in front of them. I mean, you know. Not you, not us, but people at other churches probably think that way. But you know, we can get hot. And we can get a little sideways with people. 
And we can start wishing something bad happens to them. Okay, I'm feeling a little lonely up here. <laughs> but you know, sometimes we, we fall into that trap. But Daniel, man, I think he exhibits great compassion for him. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 14, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you of yours. In Matthew 5, 44, Jesus tells us to love our enemies. He tells us to bless those who curse us, do good to those who hate us, to pray for those who spitefully use and persecute us. I hate that verse. I would just soon see God send down fire from heaven and destroy them. Now, I'm kidding, of course. But without God's Spirit working in our hearts as believers, we're no better than the world, and we want to see judgment on people because of their actions. But here, Daniel exhibits great compassion and just a heart of brokenness, I believe, for Nebuchadnezzar. Well, verse 20, this section goes on. He said, the tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which could be seen by all the earth, verse 21, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, in which uh, was food for all, under which the beast of the field dwelt, and on whose branches the birds of the heaven had their habitation, it is you, O king, who have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens, and your dominion to the end of the earth. So the great tree, of course, is Nebuchadnezzar, verse 23. And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven, and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze and let the beast of uh, the field till seven time passes over him, probably seven years. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the king. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you. In other words, you're going to be a wild beast for seven years till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. So uh, the stump, of course, is the remnant of the kingdom, and he'll be able to come back after seven times, or presumably seven years. Verse 27, this section concludes. Therefore, verse 27, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. In other words, if you don't want all of this calamity to befall you, you need to set your pride aside, get right, repent before God. <laughs> and that is a simple life lesson for us all. Look, if we refuse to set aside our pride by not repenting and getting right with God, we too will receive the, the byproduct of that. Because pride says, I'm right. Pride says, I've done nothing wrong. But pride will always bring a downfall. It will always bring destruction. Uh, Proverbs 16, 18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And here, once again, Daniel encouraging the king, King, look, if you don't want all of this to happen to you, all you got to do is repent. All you got to do is get right with God. Boy, what a, a great word that is for everyone today. Well, number five, uh, let's come to the fifth thing we want to look at. And unfortunately, that's the pride of of the king. Number five, the pride of the king. That's in verses 28 
through 33. In verse 28 of Daniel 4, it says, All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honor of my majesty? While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and they shall drive you from men. And your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. Well, that very hour, verse 33, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. Wow. Man, he was out in the field. He, is, he was just a long hair, long fingernails. He was eating grass. He was just a wild beast out in the field. And because of his pride, he refused to repent and he refused to get right with God. And all of this calamity came upon him. <laughs> and, and the life lesson for us can't be missed. Because if we refuse to set aside our pride, if we refuse to get right with God, we too will receive the, the just due of our actions. Uh, you know, in Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Paul said, Do not be deceived. God's not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If you sow to the flesh of the flesh, you're going to reap destruction. Same thing in Romans chapter 2, verse 6. It says, God will render to each man according to to his deeds. And, and this becomes a very important issue because it would seem, it would seem that pride, pride was the very first sin. Now we do know from Ezekiel chapter 28 uh, verses 13 through 15 that Satan was in the garden of God, the garden of Eden, perfect in all of his ways. Till in Ezekiel 28, 15, till iniquity entered his heart, till sin entered his heart. So apparently, at some point in time, all the angels had a free will. Remember, Satan was a created being. He was an angel, perfect in all of his ways, Ezekiel 28, until sin entered his heart. What was the sin? It was pride. Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15 is very clear. We have the five I wills of Satan. Pride entered his heart because as he said, I will rise above the throne of God. I will be in the stars of heaven. I will, I will, I will. And God said, no, you won't. Boink, kicked him out of heaven. In fact, according to Revelation chapter 12, verse 4, he took one third of the angels with him. So at that point in time, the angels had a free will. Now, their fate is sealed. We know there's one-third bad angels, fallen angels, we call them demons, and two-thirds good angels. So this issue of pride becomes very, very important because if we, listen, if we don't humble ourselves, God will. And, and may I just tell you that God don't mess around? It's much better if we would humble ourselves than to have God humble us because when he humbles us, he takes us down. And I mean all the way down. D does anybody understand what we're talking about? Yeah, okay, three of us, okay. The rest of you are very holy and spiritual and uh, you're dismissed. Uh, look, this is a huge issue, this issue of pride. But note carefully, I love this in verse 29. Did you notice in, back in verse 29, God waited 12 months. In other words, God gave Nebuchadnezzar 12 months to repent. Wow. That really is a beautiful picture of God's long-suffering. God's patient. God's long-suffering. He gave him 12 months to get right. And I got to tell you, this blesses me to no end. Because... In 2 Peter 3.9, it 
It says the Lord is not slack concerning his promises as some count slackness, but he is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I'm so glad that God was long suffering with me. He put, <laughs> he put up with so much from me. If I were God, I would have toasted me a long time ago. But he's so patient. He's so long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. He wants us all to come to that place of repentance. And, and that's the heart that God has for each and every one of us. And that, listen carefully, that is the heart that God wants us to have toward others. Wow. We're so short with others. Well, you know, I've been praying for you for like six minutes and nothing's happened, so you're out. I'm moving on to the next one. It, it, we're, we're so short with people. Well, you know, you've said this or you've done this. I'm, I'm done with you. Like, really? You know, that's not how God treats us. And, and hopefully we exhibit that same heart toward others. Well, number six and finally, and let's wrap this up right here. The sixth and final section involves the restoration of the king, the restoration of the king. Look at verses 34 through 37. In verse 34 of Daniel 4, it says, and at the end of the time, speaking of this seven times it passes over him, presumably seven years, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? <laughs> At the same time, my reason returned to me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles restored to me. I was restored to my kingdom, the, and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth, and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to to abase or humble. So after being humbled by God, and again, it's much better if we humble ourselves than when God does it, just see what happened to him. It would seem that Nebuchadnezzar saw the light, as it were. His eyes were open to who God was and who he wasn't. He acknowledged he was prideful. We might say he confessed and repented. He acknowledged God's in control. Uh, that implies the sovereignty of God. And he acknowledged that God is just and true. In other words, he, he's saying he, he got what he deserved. Now, all of this leads many scholars to believe that Nebuchadnezzar got right with God and that he believed. Others say, no, uh, he just didn't want to get hammered again, so he was just espousing the right words. You say, well, Clark, what do you think? Look, I don't know who's in or who's out, okay? I don't know who's saved or who's not saved. Second Timothy 2.19, Paul said, The Lord knows those who are His. I have no idea who's saved. Remember back in Matthew 7.22, we quoted it earlier. Jesus said, Many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done wonders in your name? Boy, they sound like they're saved to me. Sound like they're really born again. Man, they're doing great work for the kingdom of God. And yet Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. Look, I don't know who's in. I don't know who's out. None of us do. Because only God knows the heart. You know, we look at people and we think, well, there's no way that guy's saved. He's going straight to hell for sure. Oh, really? We look at other people. Boy, they're really saved. Look at the great work they're doing for God. And you know this how? I don't know what's in somebody's heart. I don't know who's saved, who's not saved. So as it pertains to Nebuchadnezzar, 
I'm not sure, but I am sure of this. <laughs> we all need to humble ourselves. <laughs> we all need to repent. We all need to get right with God. Because if we don't humble ourselves, God will do it. And like Nebuchadnezzar, oftentimes it ends up really, really ugly. Trust me on this one. Father, we are thankful for these few minutes together. What an incredible chapter. And what great life lessons for all of us, Lord, as we, wow, look at the uh, example of Daniel and the life of Nebuchadnezzar. How practical, how personal for each and every one of us are these life lessons. And Lord, I pray that by your spirit, Father, you would um, let these sink deep into our hearts. Unlike Nebuchadnezzar, that we just wouldn't be talking the talk, but the Lord, we'd actually be walking the walk. So help us, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen.